Good evening. Welcome to NTD News. I'm Paul Graney. Here are today's top stories. A verdict has been reached in the Kim Potter trial. The former Minnesota police officer who said she mistook her gun for a taser was found guilty of first and second degree manslaughter. The FDA has authorized the emergency use of another antiviral pill. How does this one compare to Pfizer's pill, which was also, also authorized this week? I'll tell you what the studies say. Semiconductor giant Intel apologizing to China following backlash from Chinese consumers. At issue, the company's letter asking suppliers to avoid sourcing products from the Xinjiang region where forced labor is often used. California is filing a lawsuit against Walmart, accusing the retail giant of environmental negligence. And mail delivery is usually busy year-round, but even more so during the holidays. A single mom tells us about her po- job at the Postal Service. And after two years, the Shen Yun Performing Arts is back in Northern California showcasing 5,000 years of traditional Chinese culture on stage. The opening performance saw a packed house. After about four days of deliberation, jurors have convicted Kim Potter of first and second degree manslaughter. The former police officer says she mistook her gun for a taser when she shot and killed Dante Wright. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. Hennepin County Judge Regina Chu asked everyone to take a seat, and then she read the verdict. We, the jury on the charge of manslaughter in the first degree while committing a misdemeanor on or about April 11, 2021, in Hennepin County, state of Minnesota, find the defendant guilty. Potter was also found guilty of second degree manslaughter. The defense made their case for bail. Her remorse and regret for the incident is overwhelming. Uh, She's not a danger to the public whatsoever. She's made all her court appearances, including all appearances in the court. It is the Christmas holiday season. She is a devoted Catholic, no less. And uh, there is no point to to incarcerate her at this point in time. But Judge Regina Chu denied Potter's bail, saying she couldn't treat this case different than any other case. Meanwhile, supporters of the victim chanted justice for Dante Wright. Wright's mother said that when she heard the guilty verdict, she felt every single emotion one could imagine going through her body. Under Minnesota law, defendants are sentenced only on the most serious conviction if multiple counts involve the same act and the same victim. So Potter is facing just over seven years for first-degree manslaughter, and prosecutors said they plan to push for a longer sentence, and sentencing is scheduled for February 18th. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. And the U.S. will soon roll out pills to treat patients with COVID-19. A second brand was authorized for emergency use today. Just yesterday, Pfizer's pill was authorized. NTD's Magama Reno has the update. The FDA has authorized the use of another brand of pills designed to treat patients with COVID-19. Merck's antiviral treatment can be used by adults in high-risk categories, such as the elderly and people with underlying conditions. This drug is meant to treat mild to moderate disease. According to Merck, its pill was shown to lower the risk of hospitalization and death by 30 percent. The risk reduction is lower than that of Pfizer's pill, which has shown to lower the risk of hospitalization and death by about 90 percent. The FDA says Merck's pill could harm the fetuses of pregnant women, so the agency does not recommend the pill to this group of people. Experts say the Omicron variant is spreading aggressively. The U.S. is dealing with a wave of positive cases, but Japan appears to have stunted the spread of the virus. Since November, the country has reported less than 300 positive cases daily. On some days, less than 100 cases are reported in this island country, home to a population of 125 million. 
According to Our World in Data, about 80 percent of the country is fully vaccinated. Neighboring South Korea, however, has an even higher vaccination rate, but is dealing with a surge. Thousands of cases and dozens of deaths reported daily since late November. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. And believe it or not, 2021's most visited website is TikTok. Cloudflare says TikTok was in seventh place in late 2020, but has skyrocketed upwards since then. TikTok is a social media app you can use to make short videos. It's actually owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance. That's raised concerns about national security. The Trump administration tried to ban it. Second and third place went to Google and Facebook, followed by Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, YouTube, and Twitter. And tech giant Intel has issued an apology to China. The company made statements about forced labor in the Xinjiang region, which met with backlash on Chinese social media. Anthony's Juliet Song reports. An apology from U.S. tech giant Intel is going viral on the Chinese Internet. A related hashtag has attracted over 300 million views and over 100,000 discussions. Intel apologized for making statements regarding forced labor in China. In a letter, the company told its suppliers to not source goods from China's Xinjiang region, citing concerns of forced labor there. Xinjiang is located in northwestern China. It's home to 12 million Uyghurs, a predominantly Muslim ethnic minority. Washington says Beijing is committing genocide against them through slave labor, mass detention, and forced sterilization. Beijing denies rights abuses in Xinjiang. Inside China, Intel's letter sparked massive controversy. A Communist Party tabloid says Intel bites the hand that feeds it. China is one of Intel's largest markets. The company made a quarter of its sales there last year, over $20 billion. Following the backlash, the company published an apology on Chinese social media platform Weibo. It says, although our original intention was to ensure compliance with U.S. laws, this letter has caused many questions and concerns among our cherished Chinese partners, which we deeply regret. But for some Chinese Internet users, the apology is not enough. One Internet user says, why should China do business with you since you're so insincere? Another left a comment saying, then don't come to China to do business. Just go observe the law in the U.S. It's unclear if the Chinese Internet users are aware of the rights abuses in Xinjiang. Related topics are heavily censored on the Chinese Internet. And when Western companies speak out about them, Chinese state-controlled media fans nationalist anger against those companies. And Intel is not the first company that came under pressure after crossing Beijing's red line. Brands like H&M met with boycotts after expressing concerns about forced labor in Xinjiang. Adidas ran into a similar situation this year. Back in Washington, here's what the White House has to say about Intel's situation. Well, I, I can't speak to the specific situation with one company, but I can say as a general matter that we believe the private sector and the international community should oppose PRC, the PRC's weaponizing of its markets to stifle support for human rights. We also think that American companies should never feel the need to apologize for standing up for fundamental human rights or opposing repression. Saki goes on to say that, in reality, companies that fail to address forced labor in their supply chains face serious legal risk, not just in the United States, but in Europe and other regions of the world. Juliet Song, NTD News. The most consequential move so far in holding China accountable for genocide. That's how one lawmaker described a bill the president signed into law today. And today's Iris Tao has more. It's official. President Biden on Thursday signs into law legislation that bans all imports from China's Xinjiang region. That's the latest in Washington's pushback against forced labor in the region with alleged genocide. The bill passed with unanimous support in both the House and Senate earlier this month, with a bipartisan consensus rarely seen in Congress. 
The legislation requires the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to create a list of entities involved in Beijing's suppression of its own people, including ethnic minorities. It also establishes a presumption that all goods from Xinjiang were made with forced labor. Evidence has suggested that over a million minority Muslim Uyghurs have been forced into re-education camps in Xinjiang. The region is the world's major supplier of cotton for clothing and polysilicon for solar panels. I don't know that it's a surprise. That's the White House on Thursday responding to whether the U.S. is concerned that China will be upset by Biden signing the bill. Earlier this week, Beijing has just issued another round of sanctions against U.S. officials for criticizing the Chinese regime over Xinjiang. We have made no secret of our concerns. The president has spoken to them. We worked and gathered the G7 leaders uh, to sign a statement on this um, about the human rights abuses in Xinjiang. So I don't know that it's a surprise. Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton calls the new comprehensive import ban the most consequential action Congress has taken to hold China accountable for the genocide of the Uyghurs. Beijing has denied human rights accusations and called for boycotts of foreign brands that publicly cut ties with Xinjiang products in their supply chains. Iris Tao, NTD News. And oil consumption could reach record levels in 2022 even as companies try to be more eco-friendly. The International Energy Agency is predicting global oil demand will increase by 3.3 million barrels per day next year. That would match the pre-pandemic demand record set in 2019. It also expects road transportation fuels to get more expensive. But there is one exception. Its forecast for jet fuel did go down because of international travel restrictions. OPEC expects oil demand to increase globally as well. And California is accusing Walmart of environmental negligence. The state filed a lawsuit Monday uh, against the retail giant. We're not talking about a few batteries and a can of insect killer here. Walmart's own audits found that the company is illegally disposing of hazardous waste in California at a rate of more than one million items each year. Filed by California's Attorney General Rob Bonta, the 42-page document accuses the retail giant of violating state environmental laws. The suit alleged Walmart unlawfully disposed of over 159,000 pounds of hazardous waste products, that's annually, at landfills over the past six years. The waste includes alkaline and lithium batteries, pesticides, aerosol cans, toxic cleaning supplies, electronic waste, latex paints, LED LED light bulbs, and confidential customer information. Walmart said in a statement that the company will defend itself, calling the lawsuit unjustified. Bonta said in a statement that the state will hold violators accountable for breaking state laws. And Christmas season brings many packages as people send gifts throughout the country. Anthony's David Lamb spoke with the USPS mail carrier in California's Bay Area to see what her day job is like. These mail carriers begin their day at 5.30 in the morning by sorting packages. One of those carriers, Nahima Henriquez, delivers mail in San Jose. I get up around 3, 3.30 in the morning and then, um, so I, you know, get ready to come to work because uh, I start around 5.30 or 6, depending. Um, and then I drive the commute over here about an hour and a half or so, and then I start work. She lives in the city of Tracy, about 60 miles away from where she delivers packages. So I usually work uh, about 12, 10 to 12, 12 hours a day, and then I go back home. And so by the time I get home, it's around 8.30 to 9 o'clock at night. And I just repeat the same thing six days a week. Henriquez has been with the United States Postal Service for about five years. She's a single mom and has two kids, one of whom is on active military duty. On Thursday morning, she began her route around 7 a.m. She says she enjoys interacting with the customers. I know them and I know their family and they, they know my family. So it's like we, we have a, a friendship, a bond, you know, as time goes by. Henriquez feels positive towards the people on her route, even though she's been chased by dogs in the past. She said her route has over 500 deliveries to residential areas. 
Her supervisor said the delivery load was light for this day. Yeah, as far as the parcels, yeah, we've had quite a bit. Uh, today being Thursday, it slowed down a bit. Uh, but uh, we've been doing, again, as I said, a fantastic job here, and we're always ready for the challenge. Duty calls, I guess, for both my son and I. Henrique says though the work is hard, postal workers feel more appreciated during the holidays. David Lamb, NTD News, California. And Shen Yun Performing Arts returns to California after two years. Audience members shared their impressions of the performance, and NTD's Eileen Ang brings us more. After two years, the Shen Yun Performing Arts returns to the San Francisco Bay Area. Their first stop is here at the San Jose Center for the Performing Arts. Let's hear what the audience has to say. Oh, I think it's fantastic. The, the colors are amazing. Uh, there's so much happening on the stage. And you, uh, it is symmetrical, so to say, but, but you really try to follow everything and it's, it's very lively. And I want to see more. <laughs> no, it, 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 felt, it came from the heart and it f goes into my heart. And that's what I felt. It came from their heart into my heart and my soul. So yes, fabulous. Audience members appreciated seeing elements of something greater, showing compassion in times of distress. Well, I mean, we're so busy in our daily grind and, and, and just trying to get through our days and with everything that's going on in our lives right now. And I think it's really nice to get reminded of these type of uh, other aspects in our life that are also important for our well-being. And I think that shines through on stage, absolutely. Tashir attended the opening performance with his wife. So we live in a time where freedom is important and self-development is important and people in China are not allowed to express themselves and um, develop and self-actualize kind of and realize in the way that here in the West we are. I think we've lost our way a little bit. Um, there is not enough compassion between people and I think this is a way to show it, the way people are showing. I, I, I believe what you put out, you get back. And that's my well, karma, passion, whatever you want to put it. That's the way I feel these days. That brought a lot back to me. Shing Yun Performing Arts will perform in the Bay Area until January 9th and will visit Sacramento and Reno in March. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. Still to come this evening. Former NBA All-Star Joe Johnson reappearing in the league Wednesday night for the first time in more than three years. Meanwhile, in the NFL, Pro Bowl rosters are here. See which team had an NFL high of seven selections. And you've probably heard of New York City's Christmas attractions. Many are in Manhattan, like the Rockefeller Center tree. But the city has more to offer. We bring you to a spectacular winter wonderland tucked away in a small Brooklyn neighborhood. And at the University of Nebraska, animal experts made a surprising discovery. We'll take a look at an aerial performance in some campus trees. That and more here on NTD News. As many people are planning to travel for Christmas and New Year's, the New York Police Department is taking steps to prevent speeding and drunk driving. They're also warning people not to drive after smoking marijuana. Entity's Jason Perry has the story. NYPD Deputy Transportation Chief Michael Pilecki says the department is making major adjustments for the upcoming holidays. The NYPD this season, all of our uh, traffic safety assets will be deployed in unison with our government partners this holiday season to ensure that everyone who walks, bikes, drives and travels in the city of New York can do so safely. The city's transportation commissioner, Hank Gutman, said that although marijuana is legal to possess in New York City, it is illegal and dangerous to drive under its influence. Our friends at the New York Police Department will be extra vigilant but the message is simple. If you're going to drink or you're going to smoke or imbibe cannabis in any other way, walk, use mass transit, call a taxi, uh, or just stay home. But don't get behind the wheel and risk 
ruining the holiday and ruining life and ending life for yourself, your family, and fellow New Yorkers. This is our responsibility to each other. Although many people will be driving to visit their relatives this holiday season, it's important to remember to be safe. Jason Perry, NTD News. You can see Christmas decorations in all of New York City. But there's one neighborhood that outdoes the rest, transforms into a winter wonderland. Anthony's Arian Pastor was actually there last night. We're at the Diker Heights Christmas Heights in southern Brooklyn. And if you're visiting New York City this weekend, you might want to stop by. I know it's not in Manhattan, but a lot of people think it's worth the trip. Lights on almost every single house. A couple from Minnesota told me they like this little neighborhood even more than Manhattan. I think it's even better because it's in a neighborhood. It shows um, holiday spirit kind of at the more local level and not as commercialized. People from all over the world come to see this small, out-of-the-way New York City neighborhood to see the lights. Some even take guided tours. Foreigners told me this neighborhood gives them a Christmas feeling they didn't have before. You can feel the magic here, like more than in France. In Brazil, it's summer right now, and this is the Christmas that we saw on the movies and we see everywhere. The people we saw enjoyed all the decorated houses, but do they have a favorite? There's a house, I, don't, I can't remember what black it's on, but it's all green. It is all green, I freaking love it. It's like the Grinch's house. <laughs> the greenhouse definitely stands out with its music and over 50,000 green light bulbs. In case you're wondering about the cost for all these lights, according to one report, some of the houses here spent between five to eight thousand dollars in December just for their electricity bills. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. And 40-year-old shooting guard Joe Johnson making his first appearance in more than three years. Meanwhile, in the NFL, Pro Bowl rosters have been announced. And the Indianapolis Colts lead the way with seven players selected. Anthony's Dave Martin has more. Seven-time All-Star Joe Johnson, who hadn't played in the NBA since Game 7 of the 2018 Western Conference Finals with Houston, reappeared Wednesday night with the Boston Celtics in a win over Cleveland. Johnson, who is now the only active player in the league to have faced Michael Jordan, hit the final shot of the game, his trademark jumper off an isolation play. In Brooklyn, Nets coach Steve Nash said Thursday that the team has the required eight players to face the Lakers on Christmas. Those players include former MVP James Harden, but not fellow MVP Kevin Durant. Brooklyn's last three games were postponed because of a league-high 10 players in the health and safety protocols. Meanwhile, in the NFL, the Indianapolis Colts placed a league-high seven players on the Pro Bowl rosters, including running back Jonathan Taylor, who leads the league in carries, rushing yards, and rushing touchdowns. Other notables include 44-year-old Tampa Bay quarterback Tom Brady, who set a record with his 15th Pro Bowl selection. Finally, in baseball, ESPN is reporting that the Dodgers and MVP outfielder Cody Bellinger agreed on a one-year $17 million deal before the December 1st lockout, which halted transactions. Bellinger hit just 195 in 95 games this season while landing on the injured list three times. Dave Martin, NTD News, New York. At the University of Nebraska, a crew cutting down a dying oak made a surprising find, flying squirrels. Let's take a look at their acrobatics. Turns out these little creatures had been living undetected in the treetops just above the offices of the animal experts at the university's natural School of Natural Resources. That's not too surprising since the northern flying squirrel is nocturnal and fairly small weighing about as much as a tennis ball. The National Wildlife Federation says flying squirrels don't power themselves into flight like birds. Rather, they glide using a membrane that stretches between their front and hind legs. The northern flying squirrel is found primarily in the northeast, along the west coast, and into Idaho and Montana. A state zoologist says he doesn't know how the squirrels got to the area, but considers it unlikely they made it there on their own. And if you're looking for a unique spectacle to enjoy on Christmas Day, NASA may have you covered. The space agency is about to launch a $10 billion next-generation telescope into the heavens. 
That's after poor weather delayed its flight. It's the world's biggest, most powerful, and most expensive space observatory, and it's about to embark on a decades-long mission. The James Webb Space Telescope is the Hubble's successor, a next-generation observatory that scientists say will open our eyes to the wonders of the universe and even its history. The Webb's mission? To seek out the faint, twinkling light from the first stars and galaxies, providing a glimpse into cosmic creation. A telescope is really a time machine. Because light travels at a finite speed through the universe, we see the universe as it existed when that light was emitted. It's traveled through time and space, and we detect it later on. Webb is about 100 times more sensitive than Hubble. Astronomers say that advance will reveal a glimpse of the cosmos never previously seen, capturing sights from as far back as over 13 billion years ago. It's a very different kind of telescope. The Hubble telescope is optimized to see the part of the universe that our eyes can see, whereas the James Webb telescope is optimized to see in the infrared part of the spectrum, which gives us a whole different set of information about the universe. The telescope's infrared eyes will also stare down black holes and hunt for alien worlds, scouring the planet's atmospheres for water and other possible hints of life. That ability comes with enormous size requirements. Webb's mirror is the size of several parking spots, with its sunshade as big as a tennis court. It's so large it had to be folded origami style to fit into the nose cone of the European Ariane rocket, which will carry it up. But its folded nature means it all must unfold once in orbit. The failure of any of its 344 parts could doom the mission. Plus, Webb is set to orbit around the sun roughly 100 million miles from Earth, too far for a rescue mission. Webb's mission to understand exoplanets, I think, goes really to some of the core of our humanity, these fundamental questions of, are we alone in the universe? Where do we come from? Where do we go? The universe is so huge. You know, you'd think that out there somewhere there will be life. But we don't know. We have to build large instruments to tell. And Webb will make a big leap in that direction. The telescope and its rocket are poised for liftoff from Europe's spaceport in French Guiana, along Africa's coast. The Christmas Day launch is set for around 7.30 a.m. That's after several weather postponements. If all goes according to plan, Webb will be released from the rocket after a 26-minute ride into space, and it will then coast to its destination over the course of a month. Then in another five months, its infrared instruments will get to work. The telescope is an international collaboration led by NASA in partnership with the European and Canadian space agencies. We have plans for the first year. We have things that we think we'll see. We think we'll see the first galaxies. Um, we, we will characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets, but we will find new things that we have no idea exists right now. And I'm so excited to find out what that is. NTD News, New York. Still to come this evening. The U.S. and Japan are reportedly preparing for a potential crisis over Taiwan. The strategy involves the U.S. Marine Corps and Japanese self-defense forces. And a statue commemorating the Tiananmen Square massacre is gone from Hong Kong's top university. The school removed the work, which was there for two decades. Find out more here on NTD News. Travel for K Original, Jola Nemdo. The moment your five senses awaken, K Culture. The taste of Jola Nemdo leads to the world, K Food. An exhilarating memory that I will cherish. There's no end to happiness, K Life. A great place to truly enjoy traveling, K Travel, Jola Nemdo. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast cable or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times? I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff? I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased. 
and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epoch Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. See China before communism. Behold a splendid culture reborn filled with beauty, majesty, and a powerful message of hope. Come see the performance that has touched the hearts of millions. Live on stage. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. The U.S. and Japan are reportedly formulating a plan in case of a crisis over Taiwan. It comes not long after a former Japanese prime minister said that an emergency for Taiwan is an emergency for the U.S.-Japan alliance. Entity's Don Ma has more. The U.S. and Japan have come up with a draft of a contingency plan in case China invades Taiwan. That's according to Japan's Kyoto News, citing Japanese government sources. The news outlet says the plan involves the U.S. Marine Corps setting up temporary attack bases on Japanese islands. These bases will be situated on the Ryukyu Island chain. The island chain stretches from Japan to Taiwan. The U.S. bases will tackle the initial stages of a Taiwan crisis by deploying troops, and the Japanese self-defense forces will give logistical support, such as providing ammunition and fuel supplies. The news outlet says that Japan and the U.S. will formalize an operation plan in January next year. This news comes not long after a former Japanese prime minister said that the U.S. and Japan need to take a potential invasion of Taiwan seriously. There is no question that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would impose a significant risk to the land of Japan, both geographically and spatially. A Taiwan emergency is a Japanese emergency, and therefore an emergency for the Japan-U.S. alliance. Japanese Kyoto News explains under what conditions the U.S. military will set up bases. They say it will happen if the Japanese government determines that a conflict between China and Taiwan would threaten Japanese security. If Japan determines there is a security threat, the U.S. military would deploy artillery rocket systems to a temporary base location. Earlier this year, U.S. President Biden and the Japanese Prime Minister at the time issued a joint statement. They underscored the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Don Ma, NTD News. And a leading Hong Kong university has dismantled and removed a statue from its campus. For more than two decades, the statue has commemorated victims of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Now the Danish sculptor who created the piece says he's, quote, totally shocked and will be claiming compensation for any damage. A famous statue commemorating the lives lost during China's Tiananmen Square crackdown has been removed from Hong Kong University. Late on Wednesday night, security guards placed yellow barricades around the 26-foot-high copper sculpture called the Pillar of Shame. The artwork is one of the few remaining public memorials in the former British colony to remember the bloody crackdown in 1989. It features anguished human torsos to represent the pro-democracy protesters killed by the Chinese authorities. The Tiananmen incident remains a taboo subject in mainland China where it cannot be publicly commemorated. I, I don't think people would expect this thing would happen in the university, so-called, with uh, the most freedom of expression or freedom of speech. And uh, they try to become the first one to remove every history or parts of history inside the campus. Several months ago, the university sent a legal letter to the custodians of the statue, asking for its removal. In a statement, HKU said that no party had ever obtained approval to display the statue on its campus. It also called the statue fragile and said it posed potential safety issues. I'm the owner of the statue. But the Danish sculptor behind the piece has hit out at the institution. Jens Gauschut said in a statement he was totally shocked at the move against his private property 
and that he would claim compensation for any damage to the sculpture. The removal of a statue is the latest step targeting people or organisations affiliated with the sensitive June 4, 1989 date and events to mark it. Throughout the pandemic, New Yorkers have been going to neighbouring New Jersey to avoid New York City's COVID restrictions. Now Europeans are doing the same, only they go to a different country. Some people living in the Netherlands take a day trip to neighboring Belgium to avoid lockdowns, and they do so with good conscience. I don't think we need to feel guilty. The Belgian city of Antwerp lies right at the border between Belgium and the Netherlands. People can be seen strolling the streets, and street musicians are heard playing in the background. One Dutch visitor says there are many like her here in the Belgian city. We went by train, and uh, there were lots of Dutch people, what we could hear. The Dutch come to get some holiday shopping done, or just enjoy the city and have some famous Belgian waffles. Some of them see the waffles, and the trip itself especially, as a guilty pleasure. Yeah, I understand that people who live nearby Antwerpen or Belgium coming over here to, to shop their, their gifts. Like, yeah. I can understand it, but I don't think it's a good idea. Of course, people also need to have lunch or dinner for a complete short trip. People are lining up for a restaurant where their QR codes are being scanned before being let in. The restaurant worker says Dutch people have always been coming to Antwerp, not just now to avoid lockdowns. We are a popular destination to have like a weekend off anyway, so they are just a little bit more uh, present now. But soon, right after Christmas, Cinemas, theaters and more will be closed in Belgium as well. And separate studies from England and Scotland both suggest the Omicron variant is milder than the Delta. But experts and government ministers warn that people should still be as cautious as the sheer number of cases could overwhelm hospitals. The UK's NHS data shows that the number of NHS staff off work due to COVID is up over 50 percent on last week. More from NTD's David English. Two new studies show Omicron is less likely to result in severe symptoms and hospital admission than earlier COVID strains. Research from Imperial College London has indicated that people with Omicron are 20 percent less likely to need to go to hospital and 40 percent less likely to need to stay overnight. But the director of the study warns health services could still be overwhelmed. But of course, with this very, very rapid rise and increase in cases, and, and we've seen the, the national cases go above 100,000, then of course, uh, more cases means more pressure because if, if uh, e even though a smaller proportion might go, get severe disease or going to hospital, that could still result in, in many cases. And of course, that could give pressure on the health service. A separate study by scientists at the University of Edinburgh says the risk of hospitalization is two-thirds less with Omicron than Delta. Health Secretary Sajid Javid welcomed the findings but said the government would be keeping an eye on the data. We do know with Omicron that it does spread a lot more quickly, it's a lot more infectious than Delta, so any advantage gained from reduced risk of hospitalization needs to be set against that. On Wednesday, Britain reported more than 100,000 new daily cases for the first time since widespread testing was introduced. Vaccination centres saw long queues outside. We've had a lot of people come forward for the first dose now, so I think some of those people that were relying on herd immunity or just hoping to wait it out have realised that COVID is not going anywhere anytime soon. Data released by NHS England Thursday morning shows the number of staff absent because of COVID is rising. On the 19th of December, nearly 19,000 staff members were off work for COVID reasons, a 54% rise on the previous week. NHS leaders say their service is under significant pressure. David English, NTD News. And gyms have been reporting a healthy increase in memberships since restrictions have eased. Members at One London Gym say they're working on building strength and resilience to ready themselves for a new year that could see further lockdowns. They say getting their exercise at the gym is important for their mental and physical well-being. So here's entities Eddie Aitken with more. As government guidelines urges people to stay at home, it's easy to fall into a sedentary lifestyle. 
At the Hex Gym in London, trainers say members want to be resilient and better able to adapt to a changing world. Most of them work from home, so the gym is their only exercise. Public affairs consultant Simon Milson is in his 50s and has been a regular at the gym for months. So if I'm not walking to a bus or for a tube or for to the office, or just walking from the kitchen to the table to do a Zoom call, uh, you're not really getting in the exercise that you need, so hence coming here. Since reopening in May, the gym has seen the number of members increase significantly. Lily Cleghorn has an eight-year-old son and a six-year-old daughter. She wants to improve her fitness to face the future with confidence. You know, I feel like when you're feeling good about yourself, you can face things in a, you know, a more positive way. Donia Buckley is a lawyer. At 50, she's always been a fitness enthusiast. But the birth of her son made her realise she needed to build up strength. I've got a two-year-old. I want to be able to pick him up. I want to be able to run around. And he's a little boy, so he's active. So I just want to be able to keep up with him. As the owner of Hex Gym, Chris Timmons believes people will better face the stresses of the pandemic if they are strong and healthy. But it's important if you're working from home to do the right type of exercise. People have been sat at their desks, hunched over for year, a couple of years now, right? And that is not doing any good for anyone's postures or health. And so strength training is one thing that's really, really good for that and very powerful. Timmons believes people are now less focused on the short term and the pandemic has made them look for bigger positive changes. It's actually not um, a January or a New Year's resolution that people want. It's actually a change in how they're approaching their lives. The health of the club itself could be in doubt though if the government decides to impose more COVID restrictions. Timmons says January and February are important months for expanding gym memberships and any disruption to cash flow caused by lockdowns could close the gym permanently. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. And researchers are trying to recreate music as it may have sounded 800 years ago in the birthplace of Jesus. To make it happen, they're working to make copies of Crusader-era bells they found close to a famous Christian church. In Bethlehem, crusaders in the mid-13th century buried these 13 bronze bells near the Church of the Nativity on the eve of a Muslim offensive. The crusaders worried the bells might otherwise be destroyed. They slathered them in animal fat to protect them from rust. Father Stefan says the crusaders had hoped to find them later on. But they left the country and they never find them out. So by chance, while the Franciscans were building the pilgrim's house to welcome the pilgrims in Bethlehem, they excavate and they find again the bells and the organ pipe. The bells were discovered in the early 20th century, along with 200 medieval copper pipes. The bells were part of a carillon, which is a musical piece arranged for bells. Chants would accompany the carillon inside the church. This one are important because we are in Holy Land and we know that it was uh, then um, uh, the, the, the sounds uh, and the sounds landscape was very important here with the, the other religion. So we know that the bells really represents the Latin. Researchers estimate it will take about five years to cast fully functioning copies of these bells. The clappers of the original bells have long since rotted away, but they give off a clear, high-pitched chime with a knock of the knuckles. As Christian, these bells are very significant for us because they are the bells of Bethlehem, and the bells uh, announce the, the bells are symbol of nativity in the Christian world, so we have bells from Bethlehem, and those bells are also very important because they are one of the oldest bells that uh, we, the humanity has. The collection also includes the scepter of the Bishop of Bethlehem and candlesticks from the 12th century made in France. Father Stefan says he hopes the collection will be displayed and played at a museum in Jerusalem that's planned to open by 2024. Still to come. An exhibition in London brings to life the tragic story of the Titanic, featuring personal items from passengers and crew and the stories of their demise or survival. And visitors at one Paris aquarium in for a holiday surprise. Is it a new aquatic mammal? That and more here on NTD News.
Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, the CEO of MyPillow. Cancel culture has not only affected myself and my pillow, but millions of you out there. My employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you for all of your support. At my pillow, we not only have pillows, but we have hundreds of products, including my new slippers, bathrobes, sleepwear, and my new beds. We're offering the best gifts ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have this exclusive offer on the standard size my pillows, regularly $69.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. We also have the queen size my pillows, regularly $79.98, now only $24.98 with your promo code. And we have the king size, regularly $89.98, now only $29.98 with your promo code. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to receive this exclusive offer. For the first time in London, Titanic the Exhibition is displayed. Artifacts from the Titanic itself, personal items from passengers and crew, and the stories of their demise or survival bring the tragic events of April 15, 1912 to life. Anthony's Neil Woodrow visits the exhibition and speaks with the curator. This Titanic exhibition is asking you to immerse yourself in an, an emotional experience with life-size detailed recreations of the ship's interior and personal stories about the fates and heroic deeds on board. The story of the Titanic began in 1907. Lord Pirrie, chairman of shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe, and J. Bruce Ismay, director of shipping company White Star Line, planned the construction of three of the largest and widely regarded most magnificent ships in the world, the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Gigantic, later to become the Britannic. The implementation of a state-of-the-art watertight door system meant that they were considered practically unsinkable. The Titanic set sail from Southampton on the 10th of April 1912, with esteemed Captain Edward J. Smith in command and over 2,200 people aboard. It was around midnight on the 14th that the tragedy began to unfold. Klaus Wetterholm, the curator and historian for this exhibition, has dedicated more than 40 years of his life to investigating and studying the history of the Titanic. He has taken part in four expeditions to the wreckage. He reflects on the very first of these. We knew that we were approaching the spot, the Titanic spot, and I was going to do an a program for the Swedish radio but I realized that suddenly no one wanted to speak. They all silenced, and I could feel it myself. Although I tried to treat, treat this scientifically, I felt that I'm here now, and this is, this is a place where you just sort of silence. No one wanted to speak. Vetterholm tells us the story behind a necklace on display, a story that inspired another in the James Cameron film of the ill-fated cruise liner. Kate Phillips uh, was 19 years old and she met this man, Henry Morley, who owned a shop where she worked. He was 47 and they fell in love and decided to escape to the United States for a new life. So he left his family and his shops that he had and everything and escaped with her uh, under a false name. On the Titanic, he gave her this necklace here. And this is the keys to her trunk and her purse that she had on the Titanic. He died, she survived, and returned to Britain. And nine months later, she gave birth to a child. This pair of children's shoes belonged to Titanic passenger Louise King, who was four at the time of the tragedy. Seen here in this photo with her mother, taken outside a hospital in New York after they were rescued. Vetterholm relates the events of their rescue via lifeboat number two. But the sailors prevented her father from getting into the boat. Now, they spoke German, these people from Zurich, and the sailors spoke English. So they didn't understand what Louise's mother was screaming uh, when the boat was lowered. The mother screamed at her husband, telling him to try to get into their boat. And he dug under the arms of the sailors and threw himself into the lifeboat and survived. 
one of the few families in third class to survive, but he lost his brother and his sister. His daughter kept these shoes throughout her life. Um, she never spoke of them, and I've met her a couple of times actually, wonderfully old lady, we had a lot of fun, but she never spoke of the items and they were discovered in a box uh, when she had passed away. There are many stories displayed at the exhibition that enrich one's understanding of the Titanic's one and only journey, including that of first mate William Murdoch, who was in charge when the ship hit the iceberg. More than 80% of the men rescued owe their lives to him. An audio guide fills in the details as you walk around the many exhibits. The exhibition has been put together with heart and I'm walking away touched by the Titanic story. Neil Woodrow, NTD News, London. And visitors at a Paris aquarium were met with an unusual sight today. A professional diver dressed as Santa Claus delighted children and adults alike. NTD's Chenny Wu has more. You might be used to seeing Santa Claus in your local shopping mall, but probably not in a big fish tank. While visitors at a Paris aquarium were in for an unusual sight, an aquatic Santa Claus. Who knew Santa was so good at swimming? He swam among the fish as he dived into their tank on Thursday. Visitors crowded around the glass to get a closer look. We took a lot of pictures and we loved it. I think we will come back another time. The aquatic Santa Claus can be seen every year as part of the aquarium's Christmas tradition. Chenny Wu, NTD News. And tourists are returning to Finland's northernmost region after the pandemic all but canceled last year's Christmas season. But this year they're coming for a new kind of adventure. Arctic ice floating is the latest travel trend in snow-covered Finnish Lapland. Anthony's Lily Joe has the story. Far into the Arctic Circle, where the days are short and reindeer roam the streets, you'll find Lapland's latest travel trend. Arctic ice floating sees tourists blissfully floating in the icy lake. Barbara Diaz is a guide for Finnish tour agency Safatica. So as we can see in the background, we have these funny costumes. They are made of thick neoprene and they float. So people jump in the suits and they get an experience of being in a frozen lake with one part that is melted and just, just get to relax and enjoy. Diaz says it's a calming experience, but also a strange one. So you get to be in the water floating and dry. According to them, I think they can feel a little bit the temperature of the water, but the water is not so cold, it's actually warmer than outside. <laughs> a number of companies now offer the experience. Day floating trips start from 75 pounds. Safatico also offers ice floating trips that include views of the northern lights. Well, it's definitely like a very popular experience, you know. I think we do ice floating tours every single day, so for sure it's something that people want to try, especially because it's completely new. It's something that it's from here, from Lapland, you just get to do it here. French tourist Jeffrey Altima said it's like floating in space. It was like um, if we were in the space, like, uh, I don't know what can I say, but the, the water take me makes you float yes mm -hmm. makes me float and it just uh well we are good finnish lapland's tourist industry was hit hard by the pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns and travel restrictions but it's now slowly recovering lily joe ntd news that's all for today's news thank you for tuning in as always see you tomorrow night
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.